Hi, I'm Kevin Keene of Keene Mass Appraisal Consulting. I served for many years as the Director of Mass Appraisal and Analysis for the City of Philadelphia, where I managed an operation that used over 75 different models to estimate values for our inventory of over 580,000 parcels. For the next 35 minutes or so, I'll be introducing you to the basics of how regression models work. This presentation is intended to explain in very general terms how models work and why they are useful in property assessment. <clears throat> it will be useful to anyone who is interested in starting to use models or to those who have to explain how they work as an aid to transparency. So what is a model? Well, a model embodies a scientific study and application of evidence, <clears throat> a simplified description of a system or process that assists in calculations and making predictions. Multiple regression analysis, commonly known as MRA, is a technique for estimating something unknown on the basis of known and available data. In mass appraisal, the unknown are market values. The known and available data are sales prices, income, and expense data, and property characteristics. MRA models the relationship between property characteristics and value, so the value can be estimated from a set of known characteristics. MRA is widely used with great success in the assessment industry. So models offer many advantages, including objectivity, because they are data-driven, uh, there's very little room for subjectivity when you're building a model. Repeatability. Once you have the model built, you can substitute a different data file and run it, run it again. Auditability. If someone wants to know what your process is, you can hand them the script for the model and they can, it's very transparent. They can see exactly what you're doing, what goes into the values and understand how the values are being estimated and adaptability. They're very, it's very easy to update models and to constantly improve them. I believe that regression modeling should be the preferred method for most counties and municipalities. So commonly used models. Sales models are often used to predict value based on sales data. Income models are used to predict an income stream based on rental data. <clears throat> the income prediction is then capitalized to predict value. So income models are typically used for office buildings, apartment buildings, and commercial buildings. Cost models are used to predict value based on construction costs for similar buildings, and cost models are typically used for special purpose properties or industrial or a very unusual properties. Trending models compare prices to values and produce multipliers to equalize them. So this is an example of a very simple model. <clears throat> Regression models are based on the concept of ordinary least squares or OLS, which measures the squares of the errors in the estimates. It finds a line going through the sample data that minimizes the sum of the squared errors. So what we have here is a, is a uh, visualization of a simple model that predicts height based on hand size. So this model starts with a constant of 4.93. That's what's called the intercept, where the line crosses the x-axis. <clears throat> and it calculates the slope of the regression as 0.81. That would be the regression coefficient, the slope of the line, and that's why it's called linear regression. So if you start with 4.93 and multiply 0.81 times an observed hand size, you should get a pretty good uh, estimation of a person's height. Which is the unknown in this equation. 
<clears throat> so you'll notice that this line, the regression line, does not pass directly through any of the observation points. But what it does is minimize the distance or the error between all of the observations. So we can see from this that there is a correlation between hand size and height. Larger hand sizes tend to, in, tend to indicate taller people. So why do we use models? <clears throat> well, an effective valuation model needs to do two things. First, it has to provide a good estimate for the most typical property, and it has to explain why other properties have different values than the typical property. So a model that doesn't do both of these things is a poor model. Because prices for real estate fluctuate for many different reasons, assessment models must be able to account for variance from the typical property. Now models are designed to produce uniform values and to minimize errors. They don't necessarily try to be provide accurate predictions. Yeah, they have to be reasonably accurate, but accuracy isn't the main goal. All right, so if we understand this, we go back to our hand size and height model. Is this a good model? No, it isn't. It does a good job of estimating the typical, but it tries to explain variance by only one attribute. And that's hand size. So besides hand size, what other factors contribute or correlate with a person's height that can explain the observed variance? If we also, for example, knew a person's age or sex, ethnicity, foot size, could we make a better prediction? So here's, this is the real estate version of the height model. Most of us have used or are familiar with a price per square foot model. So given all these thousands of data points, each one of these points is a, is a sale. Where we have building square footage and price, and we can see how much variance there is. Well, we can correctly observe that prices in this set of data are about $125 a square foot. So if we build a model that values properties at $125 per square foot, we would have a good central tendency but we'd be failing to explain all of the points that don't fall on or near the red line. So it's one thing to say that yes, the tendency is $125 a square foot, but if we went the other way and said, well, we're gonna value properties at $125 a square foot, look how often we'd be wrong and look at how much error there would be in our estimates. So a better model would identify and adjust for other attributes that create variance in price. So you also want to notice how the straight line becomes less accurate at the high end, very large, or very small properties. So the curved line actually gives you a better fit to the data. So let's compare that with this visual representation of a model that <clears throat> compares estimated values from a multiple regression model. Now this model used building square footage too, but also location, property type, lot size, condition, and many other factors to estimate value. See how it gives us estimates that are much closer to the regression line? So if you were comparing these two, this would be a much better model than the price per square foot model. So basically what a model does is it's going to deconstruct sale prices for properties among any number of different attributes. So in this example, we've got these five attributes, building size, land, uh, land square footage, garage type and, and size, the design of the property location. And it's going to estimate the contributory effect of each attribute. And that's gonna result in a, set, a constant and a set of coefficients that can then be applied to other properties that have the same attributes, but that did not sell. And that will result in our estimate of value. So what are some desirable qualities of models? Well, they say that all models should be 
they need to be reliable. And that means that a large percentage of variance in sale price should be explained by the model. We had a rule of thumb that if we built a model that could not explain at least 70% of variance in price, we weren't going to put that model into production. It's just not reliable enough. Model should be explainable. The way the model works should be reasonably understandable. So if you're saying that there's upwards adjustments for, say, having a garage versus not having a garage or having central air versus not having a central air, those adjustments need to make sense. Models need to be at least reasonably accurate, so they have to produce values that are kind of close to real world values. If you're telling me, you know, my, the property that I just paid 200000 for is worth 50000 or is worth 500000 um, that's probably not accurate enough to make to, to fly. And models need to be frugal. And by this, we mean that they should use as few variables as possible and only variables that are significant. Now, in the old days, computing power was expensive and it was hard to come by. Now today, your cell phone has more computing power than a room full of computers that sent men to the moon. So computing power is no longer an issue, but nonetheless, you still want to use as few variables as possible, eliminate anything that's not helping, so that you only wind up with variables that are significant. So what do you need if you want to build models? Well, first, you're going to need data. You're going to need files with the most important attributes that correlate with value. So these attributes will also need to be in the file of properties that did not sell, if possible. Data in the sales file should reflect what was present at time of sale. You're going to need software that can build regression models. So there are several commercial packages that are available, uh, but the free open source R is revolutionizing the industry because it's free and it makes the ability to build models affordable for everyone. You're going to need modelers to work through the process. Um, it's a definite skill, uh, building models. And of all of the parts of it, the thing that I think is the most important is the mindset. So we all know, get to where we are based on what we know. But good modelers are able to leave their biases and their preconceptions at the door and know only what the data tells them. You have to be willing and able to be able to see something that you may never have considered. So this quality is not easy to find. A model will result in, in a constant and adjustment coefficients but in itself does not have the ability to apply them to the properties that did not sell. You will need to build a process to match the coefficients with the attributes of unsold properties and to adjust the constant by those adjustments or coefficients for each property. This is usually done through an equation or a matrix. Last, but certainly not least, you have to achieve buy-in. Uh, nobody likes change. Change is scary. We may have a process that we think will be improved by using models, but not everyone in your organization will share that opinion. Typically, people don't trust what they do not understand. So you have to have the, the ability to change people's minds to get them to understand why using models is a good thing. So how do you get past no? You've got these great models and no one wants you to use them. So as a group, assessors or appraisers or evaluators, whatever you want to call us, we are notoriously free thinking, mm. risk taking, cuddly, great dancers, some of us might be, conservative. <clears throat> we are notoriously conservative as a group. To show why you should be using models, you can measure the performance of your current process against the results obtained by using models. So you can demonstrate how much improvement there would be in using models. 
You want to be able to demonstrate that having better values, more accurate values, more uniform values will result in a decrease in the number of appeals that you get and also in the losses on appeal. And you want to compare the return on investment or ROI on the cost of modeling and its infrastructure to the increased revenues and savings generated by reducing appeal losses. So in my old office, if we won one appeal on a large office building that we would otherwise have lost, that would have paid, just by itself, would have paid for the entire modeling operation for a year. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the different structures of a model that you can build. So by far the most common is the additive model. And in an additive model, all the terms are expressed as dollars and added to a constant or subtracted from a constant to calculate value. So we've got an example of two properties that get to the garage part of the equation or the matrix with a value of 100 or 200,000. So the garage adjustment in the model is $8,000. That's going to be added to the value of both properties, and at the end you get a value of 108 or 208,000. So the advantages are that these models are relatively simple to build and to explain. They can create value for both land and building, and they are easily integrated with many CAMA systems. The disadvantages are that all of your adjustments are going to be linear, straight lines, and many of the relationships uh, between attributes and price are not linear. So as building square footage increases, um, that's not a linear relationship. The first you know, thousand square feet might be worth a dollar twenty-five or one hundred and twenty-five dollars, um, but the three thousandth square foot is not going to add that much to the value. It might be more like $90 a square foot. <clears throat> so linear adjustments are a problem. And then you have the same values are added or subtracted regardless of the relative value of the property. It's a $50,000 property, it gets an $8,000 garage adjustment. If it's a million dollar property, it gets an $8,000 garage adjustment. And that may not reflect reality. And also with an additive model, it is possible that you can create negative values. A very small house in very poor condition on a very, on a very small lot may generate a negative value, and that's not acceptable. So another popular model structure is the multiplicative model. And in a multiplicative model, all the terms are expressed as percentages or logarithms or exponents, and they're all multiplied against the constant. So going back to our example, you have the two properties, base value 100,000 or 200,000. The garage adjustment, instead of being in dollars, <clears throat> is now 8%. So on the lower value property, that's 8,000, you get 108,000. On the higher value property, it's, 16, it's a bigger number, 16,000. So your value becomes 216,000. So the advantages or that's going to give you greater accuracy and reliability. It's going to capture nonlinear relationships better because you're using logarithms, which are curves, or you can use exponents, which are para parabolic. All the adjustments are going to be proportionate with property value. So in this case, a garage in a very low value property won't be as worth as much as a garage in a very high value property. And because you're multiplying everything together, you can't wind up with a negative value. The disadvantages is that they require logarithms. Uh, but most of the software handles that, so it, they're not, it, it really isn't more difficult from the modeler's perspective. Um, they're a little more difficult to explain because of the curves, uh, the curving relationships, and you cannot generate separate land and building values. Another type of common structure is what's called a hybrid model, which is a combination of additive and multiplicative model structures. So the advantage is, is that it's very flexible. It allows for the best of both additive and multiplicative models. So you can have some coefficients 
that are dollars and some coefficients that are percentages or exponents. So going back to our example, you can have the garage adjustment be in dollars, <clears throat> but the adjustment for central air expressed as a percentage. So in this case, you're going to wind up with a value of 112,000 or 216,000. So the disadvantages to using the hybrid structure is that it requires a nonlinear model or feedback loop. So it's, it's, um, there's some subjectivity in the way the model's built. It's not as easy to explain as either a multiplicative or an additive model. And the process of, of fine tuning the adjustments is iterative. It's a trial and error process which can be very time consuming. So, what, let's talk about data. So data is typically um, represented in one of three ways. And good data is by far the most important requirement for modeling. If you want to make your models better, feed it better data, feed them better data. So the first type of data, data is what's called scalar data, and that is it's the actual number of something. So think like building square footage or lot square footage. The second is what's called binary data in which an attribute is either present or not present. So central air conditioning is typically handled in this way. You either have it or you don't. And then there are categorical attributes, which means that the data creates categories <clears throat> within the file. So if you think of something like a quality of construction code or a condition code, So the data groups or classifies the attribute. Um, type of garage is another one. So mostly when we use categorical data, you first have to convert it into a series of binary variables. So if I have four different types of garages, what I'm going to wind up with is instead of modeling that, that value for garage, I'm going to sort them into four different categories, which will be treated like binaries. It'll, it will either be present or not. So data has to be checked for completeness and accuracy. Um, so we had a rule that we could only use an attribute if it was captured reliably in at least 90% of the unsold property inventory. Because even if we have a reliable attribute in all the properties that sell, if we don't have that same level or quality of data in the unsold properties, we're not going to be able to make that adjustment to anything. So for example, we would see in our sales data um, finished basements. But in the 95% of the properties that didn't sell that we did not go inside of, we had no way of knowing if the basement was finished or not. So we could have put finished basement into the model and it probably would have been important and probably would have developed an adjustment, but we would have had nothing to apply that adjustment to, so we couldn't use it. So when I started building models back in 1996, um, our data in Philadelphia was of such poor quality that we had to run a series of data collection and improvement projects. It wasn't until 2009, that's 13 years later, that we were able to produce a model of production quality. And even today, when that team works on a model, about 80% of the time is spent identifying and resolving issues with the data. So if you're building models, you're going to spend a lot of time working on the data. So in addition to how the data is expressed in the data files, it's typically going to fall into one of these four categories. An intrinsic variable is an attribute that's related to a specific parcel and occurs within the confines of the parcel. So things like property type, building square footage, lot square footage, um, the condition of the property, type of garage, age, view, air conditioning, these are all intrinsic variables. And then you have location variables, which are very often polygons, but there are other methods of defining areas of comparability. And this says the two properties that are in roughly the same location are going to suffer to see the same effects for being generally uh, where they are on the face of the earth. 
Now, each type of property should have its own set of location vari variables. So you don't wouldn't want to use the same boundaries for retail properties as you would for single family residences. They're probably going to be different location effects. There are spatial attributes, which captures the significant relationships between parcels. So that would be the distance from desirable or undesirable features. And last, certainly not least, there are time variables. So these um, attribute, chain, uh, attribute parts of break price down and attribute some of it to change in the market over time. Now, how much data do you need? There's a rule of thumb to estimate the number of observations needed to support a model. And it is that you need at least four observations for every variable in the model. That's not attributes, it's variables. So that after I write all my, you know, get my data all set up, if I have 140 variables, I'm going to need at least 560 observations. I'd like to have more. So if you want to maximize the amount of data that you get. And again, that, that rule of thumb is really a minimal set. Typically, we would run our models in Philadelphia on thousands of observations. But how can you get more data? Well, one thing you can do is to extend the time period. By adjusting prices for time, that is expressing all prices in today's equivalents, that allows you to extend the time period. And when you're looking at how much data you need, it's probably better to say, well, this is the number of, of observations I'm going to need, and then go as far back in time as you need to do that, rather than say, I'm going to go back two years and take whatever uh, number of observations I have. If you find a problem with an observation, you'd rather adjust it then reject it. So if I have a, a, a case in the file that has uh, no building square footage, I might open uh, my imagery, my aerial imagery, and try to measure the building and get a ballpark guess of, that, of the size of the building so I don't have to lose that observation. You can use open data sources. So these would be files like from the multiple listing services or from some appraisal groups or from the state or even the federal uh, federal government or other, other departments keep data. <clears throat> so you can use those sources to give you data that may not be available in your CAMA file. Things like traffic, business starts, uh, conditions of the property at the time of sale, or a lot of other inf useful information available through open data sources. You have to take care, however, that you know that that data has been carefully scrutinized and cleaned so that it is reliable. So once you have your data, all data has to be transformed into a structure that can be used in a model. And this process is called transformation. You're going to transform data into variables. And transformation of data is where the skill level of the modelers really comes into play and where modelers can definitely distinguish themselves. So for instance, if I look at transformation of building square footage, I, I, I've used about a dozen different methods to transform building square footage. No one of them is the best to use all the time, so I have to have some understanding of what that market that I'm working with is like to decide which is the best transformation to use. So here's an example of a simple transformation, of categorical data. So categorical data is usually transformed into a series of binary attributes. A binary attribute is something that's either present or not present. So this chart shows a distribution of condition codes, and they range from 1 to 7. But we'll notice there's one case where it's missing. There's no condition code, and we're going to need to account for that. And you'll all see there's also there's no sixes. The, the vast majority of them are average, but there may be no sixes in the sales file, but there are poor condition properties in the inventory, so those are going to have to be accounted for or they'll be treated like average properties, which would be a mistake. So what do we do? We're going to create five binary variables. 
one for every condition except for average, because average is going to be the basis of comparison for each of the other five. And an account that's in, say, above average condition will have a value of one in the above average attribute and a value of zero in the other four. The case it's missing is going to be treated as average, it's going to be presumed to be average. And our poor condition properties, we're going to combine with uh, the seven category, the structure, shell or sealed or structurally compromised category. We're going to combine those, roll those into one attribute. So once your data is transformed, the attributes that must be added, they have, all have to be added to a regression statement. So in a regression statement, uh, no matter how you write it, they're all going to have some common elements. You're going to have a dependent variable, which is what are we solving for? In this case, we're solving for the log of time adjusted sale price. The method will describe uh, how the attributes would be evaluated by the model. In a backwards regression, the model starts with all of the attributes and eliminates the least significant one, one at a time, until it can't eliminate anything without degrading the performance of the model. And then it's going to keep everything that's now significant. So that process of eliminating the least significant one is repeated over and over until there's nothing more can be eliminated. So in the body of the regression statement, we have all of our transformed attributes. We have attributes for building size, attributes for the lot size, attributes for garages, condition codes, the time periods in which the properties were built, the types, different types of properties that are in the data file, um, view amenities, and overall adjustment for a size classification. That's in addition to the square footage of the building. We have whether or not they're central air, and we have all of our uh, neighborhood locations and our spatial attributes are distance from highways, commercial corridors, rec centers, uh, light rail stops, etc. So remember how models need to be able to account for variance in each price. So every one of these attributes is an opp opportunity to explain variance. There's a lot of them. And if we look at this model, everything that's italicized and in red, when we ran this model, these are the uh, attributes that dropped out as being insignificant. And they're being, what that means is not that the attribute is not significant, but it is very similar to what the base property is. And so there won't be an adjustment for these attributes. So we had a lot of opportunity here to explain variance. So what does a model produce? <clears throat> so this model produces a constant, which is an estimate for the most typical property. And the constant in this model is 12.183, which uh, translates when you take the log of it to $195,500. So then we have a set of coefficients at these B values Coefficients are adjustments to the constant. So we have adjustments for building and lot size. We have adjustments for the street class, which is a, a proxy for traffic. We have adjustments for different type property types. We have adjustments for condition and adjustments for location and adjustments for the distance or spatial attributes, distance to or from features. Now this model explains about 85% of variance in price, which is good. Remember, if it can't explain at least 70% of variance, we're probably not going to use it. And there is an upper limit. If you have a model that's explaining more than 95% of variance in price, it probably means that there's a, a, an issue with your data and your data is overfit, what they call overfit to, to certain types of property. And it's not going to do a very good job of estimating the values of anything that's not typical. Now this becomes the basis for your projection engine, the model equation. So you need to build an equation to predict values. And the equation is a constant and a series of adjustments from the model. 
In an additive model, all the terms are added to the constant. So with the binary, you have the constant, and then with a the binary attribute, it's going to be raised to the power of 0 or 1. Anything not present is going to get a 0, which means that it, this, this becomes equal to 1. Anything raised to the power of 1 is itself. So for scalar attributes, that's going to, that's going to equate to the adjustment coefficient times the number of a thing that's present. So it's the rate per, rate per square foot times the um, number of square footage, the, the number of square feet in the building. The attributes present, it becomes a zero. So you're going to need an additional step at the end of this process to convert all the, adjust, all the adjustments of one to zeros, but this is in general how it works. In the multiplicative model, all the terms are multiplied by the constant. So binary attributes are treated the same as in an additive model, except that you don't need to convert the ones to zeros, because if you multiply by one, it equals itself. With scalar attributes, the number present is raised to the power of the adjustment coefficient. And if an, adjust, if an attribute is not present, the multiplier of one is substituted for in that part of the equation. So this equation can be built in Excel or Microsoft Access or Oracle or R or many other platforms. A lot of the CAMA systems have uh, these engines built right into them. So how do you know if your models are any good? All models produce ratio statistics, um, which tell you how well the model is performing. So the adjusted R squared is the measure of how much variance is explained by the model. Median ratio measures the level of, a, of assessment generated by the model, um, coefficient of dispersion or COD, and PRD, which is price-related differential, or the PRB, price-related bias, measure um, uniformity, or what's called vertical or horizontal equity. The IAAO has published standards for these measurements and for model performance. In addition, you can create your own measurements for the accuracy that's generated by the model. So we would look at and how many, what percentage of the time are our estimates within 10% of the time adjusted sale price or within 20%. Now most states or counties have oversight regulations, which can be useful. But you always want to be proactive and you should constantly be testing your models and trying to improve performance. But the ultimate measurement is going to be public acceptance. And that's going to be reflected in, by, in how many cases are revised, uh, number of revisions made by valuers on review, um, rates of appeal, appeal losses, uh, responses by the media, and your governmental partners. So how do you choose the best fit? You've had a lot of options here, and it can be a complex issue. Models offer different degrees of sophistication, ranging from the simplest linear model, like a rate per square foot model, and then you'd have multiple regression models, geographic weighted regression models, nonlinear models, and even machine learning or artificial intelligence or gradient boosting models. So on the one hand, the more sophisticated models tend to give you better performance, although if your data isn't of great quality, it may not, there may not be much improvement in performance. But on the other hand, you have to be able to explain how the model works. So in general, if you can't explain how the model works to a fourth grader, nobody's going to let you use it. So this is a balance that has to be struck between explainability and performance. So we were actually able to build a very nice gradient boosting model, which outperformed our multiple regression models by a significant margin, but no one would even allow us to present the results.
they weren't comfortable with a model where you can't explain what's going on in the model. So if you're not using models, you ought to try to get into the game. And how do you do that? Well, the traditional barriers to using models have been knowledge and price. So you can increase your knowledge base by taking classes, and training materials. So IAAO offers classes, there's classes online, Our consultants give classes. We have a, a modeling workshop on this website that you can take. You can watch videos. There are a lot of good videos on YouTube that explain regression. In some jurisdictions, like Philadelphia's one, um, they have a mentorship program where they will actually let you sit in with them when they're working on models so you can learn by participating in the process. And there are consultants who will either work with your organization and will either build models um, or will help teach your staff how to build models, training your models how to build staff. So find a consultant or find a solution that fits your needs and your budget. But you can build regression models that can dramatically improve the quality of your assessments. Thank you very much. I hope this information has been helpful to you.